Oh, shoot, darn it. Anyways, my name is Jack Viorel. I am a husband, a father, a teacher, but for longer than any of that, I've been a surfer. And surfing's part of just about everything that I do. Now, I was a little reluctant and a little shocked, actually, to be invited to speak here because I'm much more of a surfer than I am a speaker. But nonetheless, I'm stoked to be here and excited to share with you about special needs surfing and taking the lid off. For me, this story started about 25 years ago. It was two days before school started and I got my very first teaching assignment. And it was gonna be in a classroom with medically fragile, special needs, and at-risk kids. Now don't get me wrong, I was stoked to have a job. I needed a job then, but I was terrified of this assignment. You see, I didn't even know what autism was back then. I had no idea about cerebral palsy, and I had no business managing a classroom with at-risk youth. So I was scared, but I knew from surfing that whenever you're out there and it's big and you're scared, you either commit 100% or you get out of the water. There's no in between. So I gave it some thought and I decided I'm gonna go for this one. And so I took the job. Now needless to say, that first year was the biggest wipeout I had ever taken. <laughs> In fact, it was more like a series of bad wipeouts, one after the other. But every time I'd wipe out, I'd pop up, I'd realize I had survived, and I'd paddle right back out. You see, I knew I was in the right place. I knew I was doing what I was meant to be doing. I just had to find a way to make it work. And luckily enough for me, I had a teacher's aide in there that she was just magic with kids that need a little extra help or special attention. So I watched her and I learned from her and little by little I got better. Little by little I improved and one day it just sort of clicked for me, kind of like surfing can click. You paddle in, you get to your feet, you make the drop, you make the bottom turn and you lock in for this incredible ride. Well, for me it was clicking in the classroom and I locked in for this incredible wave that I've been on ever since. You see, I love trying to make a difference in a child's life. I love trying to help a child be successful in any way. And I really love helping the underdog. Now in 25 years of teaching, I've come to believe a few things. If you want to have success in the classroom, if you want to make a difference in a child's life, you've got to take the lid off first. You've got to open a child's mind, heart, and soul first before you try to teach them something. A minute ago, I poured water in over a closed container. It didn't work. Teaching's the same way. You've got to open up a child first before you try to do anything. When I failed teaching, it was because I didn't get the lid off first. I've watched others struggle because they don't take the lid off first sometimes. But how do you do that? There's so many different types of children, especially if you're going to include medically fragile special needs and at-risk youth. So how do you do that? It can be difficult. Well, I've come to believe three very important things. If you're going to have success, if you're going to make a difference. The number one thing, inclusion. What happens to one child, like it or not, happens to every single one of us. And we're all in this together. So we all have to be part. I believe that every child can succeed in a regular classroom setting or regular learning environment if given the proper resources. It's good for the typical child, and I'll tell you why. It builds compassion. It's good for the typical child, it's good for the not so typical child, and it's good for the teacher. And I believe if we build compassion first, this is much more important than testing, technology, anything else you can do. If we build compassion in our youth first. Success for everyone will follow. I believe that. The second thing I believe is that self-esteem is the foundation for learning. It's not phonics. It's not reading. It's not skills. Self-esteem. The child with little to no self-esteem can achieve almost nothing. But a child with healthy self-esteem can achieve anything they put their mind to. The sky is the limit. And finally, surfing. 
Now, I think I mentioned that surfing's part of everything I do. Well, this is no different. I found myself using surfing stories, surfing analogies, surfing metaphors, surfing life lessons to reach, teach, and connect with children. Surfing was my vehicle. Now, there's tons of vehicles out there, millions of vehicles. You've got to find something you're passionate about and use that to connect with children. I believe if you do that too, success will follow. So it is, I believe, inclusion, self-esteem, and having a vehicle, most important things you can do in teaching to have success. It was about nine years ago that my family and I moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. And I found Wilmington to be the beautiful place, white sand beaches, beautiful warm water, gentle waves. I found it to be a perfect place to learn to surf. And it was in Wilmington that I decided to put these ideas to the test, this ideas of education, this inclusion, the self-esteem, and surfing as a vehicle to the test. And so I decided to build my own surf school. But this was going to be unlike any surf school that there had ever been, because we were going to include anyone and everyone, including medically fragile, special needs, at-risk youth. Those most excluded from surfing were going to be included in this program. So I got to work building. I bought the typical equipment that you'd use for typical children. And I also bought specialized equipment that you could use for the not-so-typical child. Oversized surfboards. Surfboards with handles. Surfboards made out of foam. So that we could include anyone and everyone. And where I couldn't buy that equipment, we designed and made our own. Or modified what we had so that we could serve anybody. We were never going to tell someone, no, they can't surf with us. And for the staff, for the instructors, I sought out the absolute best. And we paid really well. I know that's a novel concept in education. <laughs> but it works. Um, and so we sought out the best staff we could. And whenever we fell short, we trained like there was no tomorrow. We put ourselves in position to be able to deal with any child that came our way. And so we had that inclusion. We had the equipment and the manpower to include anybody. For the self-esteem part of this, I designed a curriculum that was based on self-esteem first. Learning to surf was secondary. But we built self-esteem in our camps, and that's why our camps that we put on for medically fragile special needs, at-risk youth, even the typical camps, um, take a week. Because it takes us a week to go through the life skills learning process and the Self-esteem building process takes us a week, so our camps are week long. And finally, for surfing as a vehicle, surfing is our vehicle, it's not our goal. In our surf camps, we are shooting for something much greater than surfing. For the autistic child, we could be shooting for communication skills. For the child with cerebral palsy, it might be mobility. For the child that's blind, maybe we're helping them shed their limiting beliefs. And for the orphan girl in India, helping them build self-worth. And for the typical child, it could be any number of things. But whatever it is, though, it becomes much less about surfing and much more about everything else in their lives. And so in the end, it doesn't even matter if they ever surf again, because when they go through our camp, they leave with a sense of, if I can surf, I can do anything. And that is a very powerful thing. And so we had the inclusion the manpower and the equipment. We had the self-esteem, the curriculum, and we had the philosophy of surfing as a vehicle. It was time to start. And the first camp that we ever did was for kids born with HIV and AIDS. And it was everything we set out to accomplish. Kids came in here, the lowest self-esteem you can imagine, and they left up here, shoulders up, head high, laughing, having fun, thinking about a future. And all those kids, they were walking on water, basically. And, and if you can walk on water, what can't you do? They could do anything. And that's what happened. They went from here to here. It was because we included them. We built their self-esteem first, and we used surfing to do it. And at that point, we knew we were on to something. That was eight years ago in May. By July of that same year, we all of a sudden were serving hundreds of kids when the word got out. Kids from the Boys and Girls Club kids with diabetes, kids that were blind, kids that could, had hearing impairments, kids with autism, wounded warriors, 
You name it, we were serving them, and the floodgates were open. Now, we have hundreds, thousands maybe, of stories of success for these kids that came in here and left up here, changed their lives completely. Um, I know this is a time limit on this, so I'm not going to take, I, I could talk all day about kids that we've had success with. But I'd like to just tell you a few stories before I wrap it up. The first story is about a girl named Rena. Um, we have a program for orphan girls in India, and these girls have the most horrific stories you have ever heard. Girls found on street corners, girls found in brothels, girls found in trash cans. This girl, Rena, um, she was found on a street corner. She had been bound hand and foot, and one of her eyes gouged out so that she could be a better beggar on the street. So when we met Rena for the very first time, we went to India. You can imagine her self-esteem, her outlook on her own life. It was zero. It was pitiful. It was, there was nothing. And she'd been you know, bad beha poorly behaved, notoriously bad behaved, notoriously doing poorly in school. Um, she just had given up on life completely. We came in there and we did what we always do. We included her in the camp. We spent the week building her self-esteem and we used surfing as our vehicle to do it. And like every girl in there that went on this trip, when we finished that week, she had gone from way down here to way up here. Shoulders up, head up, laughing, giggling like a little kid, having a great time communicating with us. And it was, it, the changes in her were profound and measurable and visible. It's like that with all the kids we serve. But why I chose Rena was at the end of that camp, Rena had written me a letter. Um, that let me know that this had more impact than just a week of fun surfing. And the letter went something like this. I didn't speak her language, but I, could, I got it translated, and I kind of had an idea. Um, and it said, I promise you I will do better in school from now on. I promise you that I will have a better outlook on my own future and work towards my future. I promise you that I'll be better behaved. If you promise me, you'll come back. And so... That was, and then her letter ended with this. When I play in the ocean, I feel like a fish. My wounds are washed away. It is something beautiful. It is something wonderful. It is something magical. And that summed it up for all of us in this program. We're getting ready in two months to go back for our sixth trip to India. We'll see Rena again for the sixth time. She's doing great in school. She's behaving better. She talks about her own future, and she wants to help others the way we helped her. So it changed her life completely. She went from here to here because of the inclusion, because of the building self-esteem, and because we use surfing as a vehicle. I'd like to also tell you about Diane. Diane is a ripping little surfer. He's been surfing with us for about six or seven years, and he's a wild man, so we call him Dynamite. He's also blind, totally blind. And um, he surfs as well as anybody I've ever taught to surf. But the problem with Diane was he was being teased, harassed, and bullied at school because of his condition. Don't ask me why that is, but that's how it was. So he came to us. We did the same thing. We included him. We, used surf, we built his self-esteem. We used surfing to do it. His visually impaired teacher, Kelly Fort, a good friend of ours, she decided that she wanted to film him surfing because he was doing so well that very first year and take it back to his school and show the kids at his school and see what happened. She did that. The school was willing. The kids saw the video. And the teasing, the harassing, and the bully, bullying instantly stopped. Because now, all of a sudden, he was a typical child. He was a little bit different, but he was no less. In fact, he was doing something most of them couldn't even do. And he did it well, without eyesight. So his life, again, like many others, has been changed forever. He came in here, left up here, and it's never going to be the same for him. Finally, Timmy Newton. We call him Timmy Neutron. He, Timmy has cerebral palsy. Timmy's bound tightly on land and very heavy and dense and awkward. He can't move very well. So surfing in the traditional sense for Timmy is not really in the cards. 
but surfing on Timmy's terms is. It takes about four of us, four instructors, to get him out of his car, get him over the sand dune, down to the water's edge. It takes the same four instructors to get a rash guard on him, get a life vest on him, and get him laying down on one of our surfboards with the handles and get his hands wrapped around the handles. It takes the same four people to get him through the breakers and out to the deep water. And then here's how Timmy surfs. Take the board and we just tip it over. He slides into the warm salt water. And Timmy starts moving his arms in a way that he cannot move on land. And then he starts moving his legs in a way that he cannot move them on land. And this overwhelming sense of happiness and peacefulness come over him. Usually, in a few minutes, you start hearing... See, Timmy falls asleep, and I think he's dreaming of all the big waves he's surfing all over the world. He'll sleep for 15, 20 minutes, and while he's sleeping, he's still moving his arms and legs. When he wakes up, we'll belly ride a wave in. He hoots and hollers the whole way in. He takes a little break, and then he goes out and does it again. He's been in our hearing-impaired camp for four or five years now. And like I said, I could tell hundreds of these stories, and it was hard to pick some out. Um, I hope you enjoyed those, and um, if you want to hear more, I'm, I love, because those people that were with me last night know, I love telling those stories. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up now. And to wrap it up, I'd like to offer this. The numbers of medically fragile, special needs, and at-risk youth are staggering and growing by the day. If you are a teacher, a parent, a counselor, a coach, leader of any type of organization, I, I, I would guess that there's a 100% chance that you're going to come in contact with a special needs child ha and have to communicate or teach something. And if you do find yourself in that position, and if you do find yourself struggling, please consider this. Am I including everyone in this? Do I have an inclusive attitude? Am I building self-esteem before I try to teach stuff? Do I have a vehicle to reach, teach, and connect with this child or these children? Am I taking the lid off first and opening the child's mind, heart, and soul? Because if you are doing those things, I believe, in fact, I guarantee you'll get this. Thank you.